Let's go ahead and kick things off. Um, so good afternoon and welcome to our breakout session today. It's titled Gaining Perspective on the Cancer Experience. And I am so excited to introduce our speaker, Susan Headland. She is the Director of Patient and Family Support Services at the Oregon Health and Science Knight Cancer Institute. Susan has been an oncology social worker for over 30 years, and she specializes in the development and provision of psychosocial support services for people with cancer and their loved ones. Currently, she supervises a team of oncology social workers and coordinates wellness offerings of yoga, mindfulness-based stress reduction, exercise, massage, and retreats for people with cancer. And I'm excited to moderate this session today, and I encourage you to, um, in the chat box, ask questions and you know share your story, comment, um, and we'll set aside some time too for a question and answer session. Um, but please, you know, as we transfer over to this virtual symposium, we want to do our best to be engaged with you and connect with you all um, through this whole event. So I'll let Susan take it away from there. Thank you. It is um, an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, NCCS is an organization I have uh, followed my whole career and I, I love the work that all of you do and welcome to our webinar today and um, I hope that you're all staying as safe and as well as is possible in these very unprecedented times. Um, one of the things that I wanted to um, just highlight are the growing numbers of cancer survivors that um, are alive and doing well in the United States. Um, when I started my career, um, the survival rates were, were not great. Um, I worked in oncology in the early 80s and um, we had some success with some diseases, but not a lot. Our earliest successes were actually in pediatric oncology. And I'm, I'm looking at a, a graph here where in 1975, we had 3.6 million cancer survivors alive in the United States. And that number, 3.6 million, by 2016 had gone to 15.5 million and is expected to reach 26.1 million by 2040. Um, and that, that's really dramatic in the course of not so many years to see all those changes. Now, of course, we also know that we've made more progress with some diseases than with others. So for example, made tremendous progress with breast and prostate and colon cancer and and our pr progress has been slower with diseases such as pancreatic cancer and lung cancers although um, things are changing daily with all of the genetic testing with the um, immune therapies that are, are coming on online and the kind of hybrid therapies that are uh, we're seeing more and more of but but we know that um, surviving cancer is complicated and so one of the things that I think it's important to return to is how do we define who's a cancer survivor? And uh, it's actually NCCS that is the definition that most of us rely on, which is that a, a person is considered a survivor. Um, let me just find my diagnosis here. The, um, anyone who has been, uh, excuse me, my definition, uh, anyone who has been diagnosed with cancer from the time of their diagnosis through the rest of their lives. And I really love that diagnosis or that definition, excuse me, because in the past we had this um, kind of number of a five-year mark that would determine survivorship. And as time has gone on, as we've understood cancer as a whole host of different diseases, we know that that five-year mark may not be as relevant for certain kinds of diseases such as breast cancer, for example. And so I love the NCCS definition that is much more inclusive and acknowledges that anyone who has been diagnosed with cancer is a survivor for the rest of their lives. Now, not everyone loves that term, but I, for the sake of this particular discussion, I think it's useful to think about that. But we know that there are a lot of things that can happen as a result of, um, of a, a diagnosis of cancer. And, and many people that I work with tell, will tell me they, the, the, the cancer diagnosis is a point of demarcation, that they have life before cancer and life after cancer. Um, for some, the, the four domains of survivorship that we, we see people's lives affected by are the physical domains, which may include um, uh, everything from 
neuropathies or fatigues or fertility issues um, or other late effects of treatment or the also predisposition for other kinds of cancers as a result of the treatment that, that the person's received. So physically, we've got a whole uh, a domain to consider when a person finishes treatment. Another aspect is, is the psychological impact. I think many people describe that it, they're, they're kind of getting used to a new normal after a cancer diagnosis. And in, in my clinical practice, um, I think people really steal themselves to get through treatment and on the other side of treatment um, start to then have the emotional wherewithal to think about who am I now? How has my life changed as a result of my diagnosis? How am I still the same? Um, what are the relationships that may be different? So that's a whole social aspect of things that some people will say, you know, um, I don't have as much tolerance for relationships that don't, don't feed my soul <laughs> than I did prior to this. Um, also spiritually, many people find their, their faith either strengthened or challenged as a result of being diagnosed with cancer. And so when I'm working with survivors, I try to really look at that whole um, domain of the physical, what, what, what is the long-term impact of having been through treatment, the spiritual, um, the social, um, which also includes the financial toxicity. Uh, for some people, they may have lost their ability to work during that time, others not so much. Um, but then psychologically, I think for many people, particularly in the early years post-treatment, uh, there's a lot of anxiety around recurrence. Um, and so there may be some psychological fallout around depression, anxiety, that sort of thing, and certainly just managing the stress. Usually people tell us the longer they go from treatment without uh, serious side effects or a recurrence, um, the less anx anxious they feel. Um, but again, we're talking about a lot of different diseases, and so not um, one size doesn't fit all cancer survivors. So those are just some of the themes I think about when I'm thinking about survivorship and working um, with people who have been through the cancer experience. That's so great. Um... So thank you for that introduction to the type of work you do and what are some of the issues facing cancer survivors, um, especially the psychosocial piece. And I know now, you know, during this pandemic, so many people are, you know, facing a really unique and challenging time. And it, with that compounded with a diagnosis of cancer, and especially, you know, we've been hearing from a lot of patients, their care has been really disrupted. And that is scary. Um, we, I interviewed some, uh, an oncologist who was, um, you know, works with some clinical trials and was saying that they really had to reach out and kind of like beg the patients to stay in the clinical trial because they didn't want to derail this like, you know, really amazing progress that they had made. But as a patient, I can imagine, you know, like you don't want to go to a medical facility right now if you don't have to. And so, there's just so many things, I think, causing extra stress and anxiety for cancer patients. So what have you seen and heard from your oncology team and their patients? And what are some of the biggest, what are, what's some of the advice that you, you give them and, and how they approach that? You bet. You're so right. Things have been so disrupted. And um, I know that I, I'm in a in Again, in our state, shut things down very, very quickly and immediately went to a no visitation policy on their inpatient units, which was just so, so difficult for our patients. And we had, we had very few exceptions to that policy, and, and that has also been true on the outpatient side. And from a public health perspective, it's been what has helped us keep our numbers low in terms of, of the incidence of COVID. But from a personal perspective, it's so devastating because, you know, we know how frightening it is to have cancer. And you, of course, often want your loved one to be there um, as well to, you know, to walk with you, to be another set of ears, to give you support. And so to not be able to allow for that has been very, very difficult. One of the things my team of social workers has been working Working remotely, we're just about to go back uh, next week. But one of the things that um, I've been asking my team to pay attention to are, are any potential silver linings. And so, 
one of the things that has happened, um, which I think is happening in many cancer centers across the United States, is we're doing far more virtual visits and telephone visits as well, which are certainly not the same as being in person, but many of our patients tell us that they, as you said, they, they don't feel comfortable coming to the hospital if they don't have to. And so the virtual visits are one alternative to that. And, and prior to COVID, um, it was hard to get the, both everything from the IT folks to make it happen as well as insurers to cover it and that has completely changed and so um, for a state like ours which is a fairly rural state um, many of our patients would much prefer continuing with a virtual visit rather than taking the three-hour drive into portland if they don't have to do that so that's one silver lining another thing is that i've been facilitating a lot of um, virtual support groups and I think that that's been very helpful in terms of reducing isolation. It's certainly not the same as being together in person, but it's amazing how just seeing each other's faces on the screen and being able to check in with one another can, can be really, really helpful. Yeah, so I'm just curious, what does a virtual support group look like now? I mean, that's something that I've never participated in. I know some of our patients have, or, or they've reached out to ask us to connect them with some because yeah. they the great benefits from it. Um, but how is that set up for you? It's really interesting. There, there's several platforms um, that, that one can use. Um, WebEx is the one that my institution is using, but some of our community um, nonprofit groups, the Ovarian Cancer Alliance and um, the Pink Lemonade Breast Cancer Project in our communities have set them up via Zoom. And so uh, there's a, a Zoom number that you can dial into and you can choose to have your camera on or not. <laughs> and, and so, you, you know, you can see as many as like 20 faces come up on the screen. And um, one of the fun things we did last week with the ovarian cancer group was to um, check in with the a person and then have them tap the next person that they could see on the screen to to check in and it actually was really fun and very supportive we've also in my program moved our mindfulness based stress reduction classes our writing groups and our uh, yoga class to a virtual platform as well and it's not the same as being in person but it it helps reduce the isolation i think okay yeah, and everybody can still kind of talk to each other mm -hmm, and see each mm -hmm, other. So mm -hmm. really yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, so I'm curious what, I guess pre-COVID, what was kind of, did you see as the number one concern, like psychosocial concern for cancer patients? And then post, or I guess during COVID, the pandemic, mm -hmm. what has that changed? Mm -hmm. uh, what are you seeing more of? Mm. So pre-COVID, um, you know, there, there's a Commission on Cancer's mandate that we screen um, all of our newly diagnosed cancer patients for distress. And it was named distress because um, they didn't want it to seem like a stigma, a mental health stigma, that a person was experiencing distress as a result of a diagnosis because who wouldn't be distressed? And so the Commission on Cancer, based on an Institute of Medicine report, put that mandate into our accreditation for most of our cancer centers. And the IOM report was, talked about how we were missing how distressed people were and that we needed to do a better job of recognizing that sooner. And, and some, some of our patients come to us with histories of pre-existing trauma or depression or anxiety predating cancer. And then for others, cancer is the trauma itself. And so my team tries to be pretty proactive in reaching out to find out how are people doing because many of our patients were, um, you know, we, they'd put on their best game face to come to see their doctors and we were missing it. And so we wanted to make sure we were more proactive in letting people know there was support available to them if they were having a hard time. And that still remains really important during COVID, but I think the complication of COVID is our isolation. You know, we, we're being told we have to stay home to stay safe if, if we can. Um, as you mentioned, some people have been postponing or delaying certain treatments, which we really don't want people to do. Um, we want to keep them safe, but we also want them to keep them engaged in, in treatment. Um, and 
I think the, the, the piece that is hard right now with the isolation is that the things we would normally do as a community to support one another through, through difficult times um, are much more restrictive. You know, we, we're not supposed to gather into groups. We aren't supposed to celebrate, you know, um, anniversaries, birthdays, even our, our other rituals such as funerals, memorial services, they're being postponed. And I think that, that makes it much harder because usually in times of distress, one of the ways we heal is, is in community, uh, which is why I think the Zoom support groups and other offerings are really important until we have a vaccine and it's safer. Right. So in addition to the Zoom support groups and virtually reaching out to people, what are some other ways that you've seen are successful for patients coping with the stress and anxiety right now? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think a, a couple of things. Um, I think finding ways to stay connected, you know, as the seasons change, as the weather hopefully gets a little bit better, you know, it, we, we always encourage our, our cancer survivors to stay as active as they can. So, you know, even, you know, safely spaced walking, you know, to, with, with a friend or a peer or another survivor can be a really helpful thing. Managing our own distress, I think, is, is really important during this time because I think we're pretty bombarded with a lot of information these days. And, um, you know, one of the things that can be really hard is, you know, turning off the news, <laughs> for example, you know, so that we're not just constantly bombarded with, with information that can be frightening or add to our distress. And so, you know, one of the things I'm encouraging people to do is to you know, stay connected with information, but but take a break from screen time, take a break from your devices, take a break from the news, that kind of thing. Um, some of our patients are telling us that they're arranging for like a Zoom happy hour with with their best friend, you know, or one of um, one of my patients says that she does a um, a card game every Friday night with virtually with one of her, her girlfriends with a glass of wine or, you know, whatever, <laughs> just to try to make it feel a little bit more normal. Um, and I think with different kinds, I'm seeing in the chat, Father's Day is coming up, but we're limited, you know, chatting on the phone, go for a long walk, um, chat on the phone with an old friend. A couple of my patients have told me they're much more intentional about staying in touch with their loved ones during this time yeah. um, in a much more pro proactive way, which is, is good. But I, I think that um, mention, when I was mentioning the bombardment of information, um, if, if you don't already have any kind of a relaxation or stress reduction practice, really encourage people to uh, think about it. It, it can be as, as um, disciplined as mindfulness-based stress reduction, or it can be a 10-minute calm app on your phone. There are lots of apps that are free these days that just take you through some deep breathing exercises and some relaxation techniques, because what we know is when we're really stressed, when we're really anxious, we tend to have a physiological response that we uh, have a much um, much shorter breathing, a push of adrenaline, a push of cortisol, heart rate goes up. And, and often when we're anxious, we're either worrying about the future or kind of ruminating about the past. And both of those take us out of the present moment, which is what we have some control over. We don't have a lot of control over the future. We don't have a lot of control over the past. But coming back to the present moment can slow down that physiological fight or flight reaction and can help us stay in the moment and be a little bit less distressed. UCLA has a lot of, um, in their cancer center, have a lot of free uh, apps that you can download um, around relaxation. Others that are um, on, that you can put on your phone are Calm, uh, Insight Timer, Headspace, or just a few that are being offered for free right now. That's great. Yeah, I, I started to do Headspace and I love, I think it's like an Australian guy's voice and I love his voice now, but I noticed that I really, cause like I would start going for a walk or something and that was nice, but I would still be like yeah. thinking just so much and couldn't really, like you said, be in the moment. And that, that I found that the guided meditation, which I had never done before was really helpful. So is that, when you say mindfulness based stress reduction, what is that exactly? So that's a program, we, we offer that in my center. It's a program that 
was based from uh, out of Harvard. It was John Kabat-Zinn's work um, around um, the physiological response to stress and conversely how to um, uh, train the mind to quiet the body. Mm -hmm. and, and so mindfulness just very, very simply stated is to be in the moment. And so, as I mentioned, when we're anxious, we tend to either be thinking about the future or worrying about the past and kind of being pretty ruminative. And it's hard to interrupt that, which is why, as you said, having somebody guide you through it can be really helpful, especially in our culture where we are so used to multitasking and being bombarded with information all the time and our mindfulness teacher calls it monkey brain <laughs> and so it's like all these monkeys that are you know really moving around in our heads <laughs> and yeah. so um the mindfulness course the true mindfulness-based stress reduction course is actually an eight-week course uh, that's a very disciplined sort of thing where you're doing what they call a body scan and really learning these techniques to kind of quiet your body down not everybody has the bandwidth or the energy for all of that. Um, so that's where I think these shorter apps can, especially for the beginner, um, can be really helpful. Now there are lots of approaches to meditation. There's transcendental meditation. There are a variety of Buddhist types of meditations. And, and then there are these very simple relaxation techniques. Um, and I have a couple of staff members who started taking public transportation and what before COVID, and they would listen to some of these apps and they and I, I, the difference in them is noticeable. They're so much calmer. Um, but the, the thing that you have to be patient with yourself because uh, it takes time and it takes practice. And most of these apps encourage you to do them at least 10 minutes a day, preferably twice a day. And most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, can carve out 10 minutes at either end of the day. It, but it takes practice. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. That's great. Well, that's great. And uh, we'll share a list of these apps, too, and just a little bit in the chat box. Um, so I'm curious, you mentioned the anxiety around like fear of recurrence, and that's something that we hear a lot about from cancer patients. What other um, issues that you see a lot of that are unique to cancer patients? I think like that is really the one that I, that popped into my head. Mm -hmm. um, but what other psychosocial needs are there for cancer? Well, one of one of the things that um, my team is is certainly paying attention to, and and boy, the literature is really. Um, filled with this these days is the financial toxicity of cancer. Cancer is really an expensive disease to treat. And if people have, um, even for people who are pretty well insured, um, there can be huge financial fallout for the out-of-pocket out of expenses or if people, again, lose their ability to work during this time. Those are things that I know people are really, really struggling with. And it's certainly something that in, in cancer centers nationally, we're acutely aware of and trying to figure out ways to reduce the costs of, of care for people. That's one of the things that I think is especially unique to uh, cancer. It's certainly other diseases too, but cancer is kind of at the top of the list. Um, other things that I think are are really important are to Betsy Clark, who was a um, important person for NCCS and a colleague and a friend and mentor of mine who sadly recently passed away. You know, she, she and I had many conversations about the role of hope and how important hope is. And she has a document through NCCS called the, You Have the Right to Remain Hopeful. You know, sometimes what, what I hear from patients is that we providers don't always do the best job as we could in balancing the reality of the disease <clears throat> with the appropriate desire to remain hopeful. And I think in the healthcare field sometimes, um, we have we have not been as skilled as we could have been in, in talking to people about their diseases and talking to people about uh, what their options are, you know, in terms of, of staying hopeful for the future. One of the things that I think is really important is to stay abreast of emerging treatment. Um, so I'll give an example in my practice about 10 years ago, one of my patients asked me to start a, a support group for women with advanced cancers. 
And a, um, a colleague of mine and I, truthfully, were really reluctant to do it because, well, actually it's more than 10 years ago now, it's probably closer to 12 years ago, because we had done that before and the average length of life expectancy once someone had a uh, stage four disease was about 18 months. And we weren't sure that it was such a good idea to do this. Um, but my patient nevertheless persisted and she was very convincing. And so we started the group, which was one of the best things we've ever done. Um, the women came to us with stage four diseases and we did an analysis after the group had been running for about five years. And the women in that group were living an average of five years or more after being diagnosed with stage four disease. And now that was a far cry from the 18 months that had existed previously. And the reason I bring this up is that that was a dramatic time in cancer because all of a sudden we had all these new different kinds of treatments. Um, and so, you know, some, not only some of the hormonal treatments that were available, but the immune um, treatments that are becoming so prevalent, um, some of the smart drugs, as they, they say, and some of the clinical trials that are really changing the landscape. In fact, one of the docs that I work with said, it's never been a more exciting time to be an oncologist because so much is changing. And so it's hard to keep up with all that's happening out there, but making sure that you feel confident in your provider, uh, going, going, go to your provider with, armed with really great questions and, and staying current, you know, I think is, is huge because one of the things Betsy and I used to talk about was how the treatment team itself is a source of hope and that we can either be the source of hope or we can um, conversely destroy hope if we're not more careful with how we use language and how we connect with patients. So I think the relationship piece is really important with the treatment team. Yeah, absolutely. And having the, being aware of that as the, the for the oncology team to, to know that about the patients going in, it makes me think we recently um, did our second year of a patient survey and we found not surprising to anyone here today but we found that you know oncologists have done a great job at addressing a lot of the physical side effects of cancer treatment the nausea and the vomiting and so forth but not nearly enough for the psychosocial piece of they're not asking about or or treating the stress the anxiety right. and things like that so so what do you, where do you think that gap is? Like why, why, like what could we do about that? Well, I think it's changing. That's a good news. I think that we didn't used to pay attention to this and the Commission on Cancer's mandate for distress screening and survivorship care planning have actually helped with some of that. Um, it's interesting, my team, um, because we have been working remotely since COVID, um, I have been happy to hear that the doctors are really tired of us not being there. <laughs> and, you know, I come from, I've been in social work long enough to remember the days when they didn't even know what social workers did. And, and now uh, I'm, I'm channeling the face of one of the docs I work with who's most mad at us that we haven't been on site. <laughs> so I think that, um, I think a couple of things. I think that docs are, in the old days, um, they weren't trained on any of this. And, and so um, I kind of made it my personal mission, I don't know, about 20 years ago now, to, ask every, to have every one of our oncologists ask about depression and sexual function. And they were panicked. <laughs> and I remember after that was my campaign for one year, um, one of the docs called me and he said, okay, I asked her about depression. And, she's, and I said, that's great. What happened? And she said, he said, she's crying. Go talk to her. <laughs> So and then another, another <laughs> right, right. And another uh, physician um, who had heard me talk more than once about we have to ask about sexual function. We have to. This is a quality of life issue, and and if we don't ask, then we unintentionally send the message that it's not important. And so one of my patients came kind of flying into my office and she said, the strangest thing just happened. My doctor just asked me about sex. <laughs> and, and, and I know how that probably went because he was a, a scientist. You know, he's a scientist who, you 
know, wasn't so great at psychosocial issues. And so I feel quite certain that he um, didn't do it very comfortably. So all that to say that I think it's changing. And with these Commission on Cancer reports that or mandates that we assess for depression, we assess for, for distress, um, they are much more mindful of, of the need for psychosocial support. And then, then also we are trying to teach them this. We now with, in fellowships are teaching doctor oncologists about the psychosocial issues related to cancer diagnosis and how they might inquire. Um, the other thing that we wanna make sure happens is that that we have resources available either on site or in the community that we help connect patients to so that they don't feel like they have to do everything. Um, it's, I think, like many of these issues, it really needs to be a team. Sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you, you're frozen, but oh, I can hear you. I think I lost. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Yeah. Okay, all right, great. Um, so you mentioned uh, some of the quality of life issues and providers being able to address those. We heard yesterday from our two keynote speakers, like two different pieces of that too. Um, Dr. Tom Smith talked about the um, the sexual piece of it and making sure to ask patients about that mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of letting them know too, like if you never ask, they might not know that what they're experiencing is mm -hmm. normal or even to be expected. And, you know, it also Caitlin Flanagan in, in my interview with her talked about the support for her entire family unit. And mm -hmm. that, that was something else that we were saying, like, isn't, you know, focused on nearly enough and that you know she had a great shout out to social workers and that she got resources on how to tell her sons that she had cancer and it was just like basic stuff like that that mm -hmm. cancer patients need that information and it's not always clear where to get it from or not even of course you know there's the access issue there too it depends on what cancer cancer center you are at where you live <laughs> where you're getting your care yeah. so, yeah, exactly. There, um, there is a, a group that I'm sure you're familiar with, but I, I feel I want to give them a shout out because they have all kinds of online resources um, that we we utilize all the time. It's cancercare.org uh, yeah. in New York, and they have uh, many, many, many resources about everything from talking to your children about cancer to um, you know, other kinds of quality of life issues, managing distress and things like that. They are a wonderful resource. And you're absolutely right. I think that uh, the family is often kind of the, the silent partners in all of this that are um, carrying, carrying also the, the psychological um, distress as well and may, may need help in knowing how to support their loved one or how to have some of the harder conversations. And so um, one of the things I do, uh, I do a number of, of retreats for, for people with cancer. And when I'm uh, doing a women's retreat, I always have our um, nurse practitioner who, who works in women's health come um, to talk about sexual issues and, and things that uh, are resources that can be really helpful for them. That's great. And related to that, we have a question in the chat box from Woody asking, what suggestions can you offer to help doctors improve their bedside manner? <laughs> Sometimes they speak in clinical terms that are not easily deciphered by the patient. And I think that, you know, was captured in your anecdote about the doctor asking about depression. Like, he, even though he wanted to, it wasn't natural for him. Correct. So, <laughs> Correct. Like, what do really, I do now? <laughs> it's really awkward. It's like, oh, if I ask the question, I'm, then I might have to deal, deal with the answer, right? right. <laughs> so the, the good news is, I, I can tell you that um, even in the time that I've been in practice, schools of medicine are um, teaching medical students how to uh, give bad news and have harder conversations um, in a way that we never used to do. So, uh, for example, uh, over the course of my career, there was a big study done in 1999 um, by um, the 
uh, American Society of Clinical Oncologists, and they surveyed almost a thousand physicians, oncologists. They surveyed a thousand and they asked, how often do you have to give bad news? Um, how did you get any training in how to do so? And um, rate your ability to do it. And this was a while ago now, you know, 1999, but they only 5% had get, been given any training on how to do this. 5%. They had to give bad news 30 times a month or more. And uh, they more than 50% rated their ability to do so as poor to fair. So if I had to do something 30 times a month that I'd got no training in, I'd probably bumble through it and get it over with really fast as well. And I think many physicians are much more comfortable with their scientific brains than they are um, uh, necessarily the, the human skills, but that study was important because it woke us up. You know, it made us realize that the doctors that were really good at this either had good mentoring or they just came to it naturally. Um, and so it woke us up in, and we, we developed a whole lot of training programs with oncologists in mind and have done a lot of trainings in all medical schools now um, across the United States have communication sessions. My, my university, we just graduated our first cohort of medical students who couldn't pass medical school unless they went through our simulation lab with trained actors and were observed on their communication skills. And a lot of us are coaches for them ahead of time to teach them how to be, um, you know, more, more kind, more, you know, use, use language that we can understand instead of hiding behind the science. Um, so I'm hopeful for the future. I think it's going to get better. But per Woody's question, I think one of the things that you can do to help your doctor uh, not just speak in, in clinical terms, but to um, be more translatable is to just, just very, you know, very politely say, I'm not sure I understood those words. Could you speak to me in layperson terms? You know, or, or take your social worker with you. We interrupt doctors all the time and because we can see that the patient doesn't have a clue what the doctor just said. And so um, because of those technical terms, so just, you know, politely interrupt and, and say, I'm not sure I understand this or paraphrase what you think you've heard. And that can be helpful. Right. And that also reminds me yesterday in the conversation with Caitlin, I kind of touched on a little bit about you know, there's, it's a pretty big burden on the patient to be, I mean, we promote self-advocacy so much, we believe in it, but we also recognize that that's not necessarily for everyone, and the survey results definitely reflected that, that there was a really big difference in the patients that considered themselves a self-advocate and those that didn't want to be a self-advocate. Um, so what do you see with that kind of the differing, the types of patients and then much less the types of doctors that there are? Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's a really good point. Patients and doctors are, are a varied group, right? And so some people are fierce self-advocates and, you know, wonderful in being able to do that. And others that's uh, less comfortable or the, if truthfully they're, they're too tired or, or not feeling well enough to be an advocate for themselves. So that's where I think organizations like yours that have trained advocates um, to really step in and help can be really, really important. We have a, a number of local peer ad, patient peer advocate programs that um, we can assign like a peer mentor to someone to kind of help navigate things with them. Family members or friends can sometimes be um, a just incredible resource, you know, to go with you to appointments for another set of ears or to take notes or to ask the questions that you, you may not have the energy to ask or think to ask. Right. Um, the, other, the other thing that, that we tr are trying to teach our doctors to do is to try to help them assess how much information the patient wants. You know, so some people want every last bit of information and that that's helpful to them. And for others, it's more the kind of abbreviated summary that's more helpful. And so, so if you can identify how you like to receive information, that might be something to do as well, that, that you can maybe say to your doctor, 
could I just get the summary? I don't really need every last possible detail or vice versa, depending on who you are and what you want. Yeah. And that reminds me, I want to take a, just a second to plug an NCCS resource that is directly related to that. And it's called the Cancer Survivorship Checklist. And it has, and there are different categories for things that um, will help you self-advocate for yourself, but not have to remember every question to ask um, when you have that like short period of time with your provider. Um, so there's like the psychosocial piece, the treatment piece, uh, financial yeah. um, section of that too. And so I'll put that in the, in the chat box right now. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. I think that's really um, important and valuable information. So I wanted to talk about um, as we sort of go now into like the different phases of reopening and that can cause even more stress um, for all of us and for cancer patients who uh, and survivors who may not be ready to go back to work but might be forced to um, or who are maybe gonna you know experience um, financial hardship in the future because of continued layoffs what advice would you give those patients mm. so I, I think um those are really legitimate concerns. How do I stay safe, you know, as we re-enter? And it's not just safe regarding your cancer, but safe regarding COVID, right? And so um, I think making sure that you check with your providers in your health system about how are they reopening? You know, are, do they have a masks on policy? You know, are there other kinds of things that they would recommend that, that you take precautions about before going to your follow-up visit? Um, the, uh, the other thing that, that I think is really important if a person is being asked to go back to work is to make sure that there are um, the precautions in place like hand sanitizer and ability to work wash down or, or wipe down workstations safe spacing you know all those things that from a public health perspective we think are helpful um, and I think that's another place where being a self advocate is going to be really important so that, that you feel like you know it's as safe as can be uh, some visits, as I mentioned, it's safe to do virtually uh, if it means not postponing important um, care or treatment. And so if you may want to find out if that's an option with your providers, um, because what I'm hearing and the, the provider calls I'm on every single day is providers want their patients to stay safe too. They don't want people to delay necessary treatment, but they also don't want to expose them to unnecessary risk. And so if the virtual visit is adequate or a phone visit, that can, can be an option. And I, I guess the other thing that I would just say in general for all of us is um, control what we can control right you know we only have so much control that's true of cancer that's true of covid um and you know the things that we can control are managing our stress level paying attention to what we eat getting outside getting enough exercise you know the those kind of daily living things um and trying to stay more in the moment if we can and one of my 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 clients who's, who has prostate cancer said he came in with a list one day and, and he didn't know that this is actually uh, a, a cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a, a strategy in mental health. He didn't know that he was doing cognitive behavioral therapy on himself. And he had, he had three columns. One was things that bring me joy, things I have control over, and things I don't have any control over. And in the, the category around things I don't have any control over were whether my cancer comes back, other than you know his general health practices. Things like um, other things like climate change, the election, you know, things, big, big, giant things. And then in the list of things that brought him joy, there were his, his wife, his walk on the river, you know, and that kind of thing. And then the things he had control over were kind of interrupting worry, taking care of himself and his health practices and that sort of thing. And I think that that's a strategy that can, can be useful for, for all of us. Yeah, I love that. And it goes back to the mindfulness piece of it that you talked about earlier. 
Um, so I'm going to ask one more question. And so if there are any questions from the audience, please type them in the chat box. We would love to hear your thoughts and questions. Um, so I just want to ask, um, and Shelly, every time now, especially throughout this pandemic, we always want to end on what are the silver linings through all of this. And I think you touched a little bit on, you know, it's this importance of the psychosocial um, aspect of your care has really become really prominent now through all of this. Um, but what are some of the other silver linings that we might see through this the mm -hmm. time? Well, I think, I think some of the things that I'm hearing from patients as well as colleagues is um, really celebrating some of the simpler things. You know, um, I, I mentioned that one of my clients who's very homebound at this point, she, what she was saying about how, how intentional she's being about staying in touch with family and friends, even international family and friends that <clears throat> she didn't have as much contact with and that that's been really helpful. Um, I've been hearing people say that they are really noticing how beautiful <clears throat> things in the world are. You know, and I, I don't know how it is in each of your communities, but we've had much less traffic and much less noise <laughs> with, with yeah. this whole pandemic. And so the birds, hearing the birds sing uh, in a whole new way this year is pretty unique. And, that, and that's a mindfulness thing too, is just paying attention to what's happening. And I think there are other silver linings. I think we're in some ways taking back some of the simpler things and not taking so for granted um, our freedoms and our, um, uh, all the things that we we did every single day without paying attention to it. And so um, I think in my, my work group, we're probably going to have a hybrid of working from home and going back to work, which um, you, you know, can really be a blessing in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. And I am now posting in the chat some of the resources that oh, you good. mentioned, I see like the Calm and the UCLA piece. Um, and I'll add in the, the Headspace link. So... Mm -hmm. Um, and there's one called Insight Timer as well. Okay, great. Insight Timer. Um, and there you go. And if there are no other questions, I'll just say thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. Um, Alexa says, thank you so much, Susan. Once <laughs> the social worker for that is so true. I already know that. But thank you. Thank you. It's, a, it's an honor to work with you guys. And I just want to say thank you for the wonderful, wonderful work that NCCS does, including this. So thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. This concludes our second day of the symposium. So we'll see you next week, Monday at noon.